Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back with another episode, and I'm, of course, visiting with John Assetti. John, first of all, welcome back. Thank you so much, Tom. John, as we ended our last episode, you had completed your military service. You told about told us about some of your adventures when you were stationed overseas, but you came back home and you returned to college. What was your college experience like, and how was it different as a veteran? Tom, it was... Uh quite a revealing experience for me since I was now a mature man, a mature adult, and I was able to see things from a different perspective completely. I worked after I completed my service, it was in October, I spent a couple of months working someplace, but then I decided in January to go back to school. I had a very strong desire to return to college to get a degree and start my career. And that's when I went to the State University of New York at Geneseo. And fortunately enough, I had saved a lot of money in the military and I bought myself a car so I was able to drive to school and come home on weekends because I used to play in the local band that played for weddings and also different kinds of parties with a group of people, a group of nice friends of mine. And I became more and more fascinated with college based on my past experiences. And so I returned to college, and I rented a room at a house. And the house, mother was very nice with me. I had a room upstairs in the attic, furnished, completed, and it was just extremely comfortable. And I sat down for quite a while that first night I got there and decided that My goal was to complete college as soon as I can. So I spent my time going to school during the year. I also spent a couple summers to finish off my college in three and a half years. Two and a half years, sorry. And they gave me credit for one year. College at that time was absolutely fascinating. I found that I was not only a good listener in college, as opposed to what I was before, And I was also very much interested in asking questions, which I was reluctant to do prior to my first year in college. There were some other veterans in my class, and so that made it really very nice because we had a lot to talk about. But studies came pretty easy for me at that point. I guess I I started with being a C student. I ended up being a B student. But I studied hard. And I did all my work very carefully. I was my only focus in the college is to study, get good grades, get through. Now, one would ask me at this point, what about your social life? I didn't really have much of a social life. That was not my intention. That was not my focus. My focus was success in school, in college. And uh, I would drive home on weekends to play with music in the band, or different bands. And then I would drive back Sunday afternoon after a nice, big Italian lunch that my mother made. And then I two-hour drive, and uh, I would hit the sack for about three or four hours because I was tired, get some rest. And when I woke up, man, I was rare to study. And boy, those papers just flew off the shelf on me. And uh, they were easy to do because I was rested, I was focused, and I was raring to go. I had a goal, and I was going to achieve that goal. So I did well in school. In fact, in my last year at college, I had belonged to several clubs on campus. One was the International Relations Club because I had been in the military and I had traveled all over Europe and North Africa. And so I thought that was a place maybe I could be a good learner and maybe even share a few experiences with the students. And then my advisor, Dr. Dan Rosell, he a real neat guy. <laughs> he was my road model. And uh, we got along real well, by the way. And uh, as I was selected as president of the International Relations Club in my last year. And that was quite an honor. I didn't expect the kids to vote for an old geezer like me, but that's what I did. And I organized a club in order to enlighten the college students, university students, 
more so what's going on in the world rather than what's going on locally. And they were aghast at what's going on in Europe and North Africa. And here was a person who had been there, experienced it. And a lot of good respect there, and I appreciated that. And I felt quite confident in what I was doing. And I never became opinionated. However, I did share a lot of thoughts when I did that and organized a lot of activities for the students. For example, one thing that we did is that we used to invite the international students to our organization. And uh, they enjoyed this because they were able to communicate with the university students. We had students from all over the world at our college. So I, it was about a half dozen of them. And uh, got to know them real well, asked them a lot of questions, and they were very free to discuss their country, their culture, and their feelings about the United States. So then I graduated from the State University of College at Genesee, at Fredonia, New York. And I had the summer free. And I remember when I graduated, my parents came to the graduation. And my, also my older brother and his wife came also. And I could see how delighted my mom was for the whole afternoon during graduation. And my dad, I never saw him smile in my life. But boy, he smiled for the three or four hours he was there. He was just so happy. And I was delighted that I made him happy by graduating from college, first in the family. And it's a big deal. Oh, very big deal. And uh, I tell you, I the same thing happened after I got my master's degree. They came to my graduation. And my dad was still, like yesterday, he was just delighted that, because he encouraged me to go to college, get an education. And I remember him hugging me so many times. Oh, sometimes I even had tears in my eyes because I... I could see that he was so happy, and I had done my job. I had reached my goal. And I spent the summer working, but September I went to, I had applied for a program at the University of Buffalo, where I received my master's degree in two years. And the master's degree was in guidance and counseling. I thought, I thought at the time I wanted to be a guidance counselor. And then that changed after I graduated. Like most people, they don't probably follow their own field. It's a different field they go into. So I went into teaching. And uh, when I was teaching at the time, I was working on my master's degree. Now, at the end of my master's degree, when I was finishing my term paper, I had been going with a beautiful, wonderful woman. We got engaged, and we were ready to get married. But I was pushing myself at college. I was going nuts, trying to finish my term paper and make plans to get married. And we were going on a honeymoon. And, uh, and my wife knew there was a problem, but she said, you get through this, no problem. And so we did get married at the end of my college career there. And I remember we went to the Buffalo Airport to fly to Bermuda. At the airport, I said, sweetheart, I really hate to tell you this, but I don't feel well at all. And maybe we should call a doctor. I'm not sure what it was, but I just wasn't feeling well. I was exhausted first of all. She said, let's call a doctor. I said, okay. So within a few minutes, a doctor came and checked me out. And he says, so you're okay, except you had the beginning of an ulcer because I was worried so much about Finishing my thesis, finishing my college career, getting married, making plans for my honeymoon, it was just too much. So I said, oh, my God, that, there goes my honeymoon. And my wife said, oh, my God, I'm going to be a widow. I just got married a couple hours ago. We chuckled about it later. And so he said, I have a solution for you. He says, drink a lot of milk. In fact, get some milk right now. And on the airplane, ask for milk. And when you get to where you're going, ask for milk. And you'll be fine. And that's what I did. And I was impressed that the milk took care of my ulcer. And I said, because I'd like to have a cocktail. I'd like to have a beer on my honeymoon. I think I should be able to do that. You know what I mean? Great time. But everything turned out fine, and the ulcer went away. So 
we simmered down. So then I started my public school career teaching. Now that in itself is a a miracle for me because I never thought that I would become a teacher. Primarily because I hated teachers when I was in the elementary school. I think I said previous to you when I shared with you about my experience in third grade where I wet my pants in front of the class and, and I hated teachers that they wouldn't allow me to go to the bathroom, even though I not only asked once, I asked twice, and I still couldn't go to the bathroom. So that was a terrible incident. But it, what was interesting, Tom, is that sometimes adversity brings out the challenge in you to get something done. And so I decided that I'm not going to allow a one teacher, because she said no to me to go to the bathroom, to destroy my career, but I will become the best teacher around as a result of that. What were you teaching? I was teaching elementary school. Okay, so no subject, no specific subject matter. No, grade six, all subjects. I started teaching sixth grade, which was a challenge in itself, by the way. These kids are just getting to be teenagers, and it's a difficult group, but I loved it. But I was prepared for them because I had planned and planned over the summer what I was going to do. And the first thing I planned, first thing, the first hour of the class I had, the lesson was designed specifically by me dealing with health. And I put on the board a number of words. One was urinate. Two was defecate. Now, why did I put those words on the board? I want to make sure that I can trust and show respect for these kids who need to go to the bathroom. Does that begin to make sense? And I said, I'm going to design a program to make sure they know that I trust them. And I want to show that trust by how I'm going to design this program. So I begin to explain to them that one of the first things that we should know in class is that everyone, every human being and every animal needs to go to the bathroom. It's been like that since the beginning of time, boys and girls, since the beginning of time. And so what I've done And I put those words on the board, because I would like you to remember them. We're going to make a plan that if you have to go to the bathroom, you don't have to ask me permission. You can just go on your own. And here's what you have to do. I says, you see the board, chalkboard up there on the right-hand side at the bottom? Okay, that's going to be your section. Now, if any of you need to go to the bathroom, boy or girl, you go up there and you just print your name. That's the name that means that you are at the bathroom. And then you come back. And another person can go. You don't have to ask me. Because what you're doing when you have to ask me, you have to interrupt what I'm teaching you. And you're going to lose out that way. If we have 30 students... That means I have to wait 30 times until you go to the bathroom and come back. No, I'm not going to do that. I trust you as a student, knowing that this is required. We all have to go to the bathroom. Some of us have to urinate. Some of us have to defecate. Now, you, you use other names for that, and adults use other names too. But that's the correct names to you. I was teaching them health lesson. Now, when you go to the bathroom, please remember... Do what you have to do and come right back so you don't miss any of what's going on in the class in regard to learning. But remember, when you finish doing what you have to do, wash your hands with soap and water and count to 50 while you're doing that in order to make sure your hands are nice and clean because there's a lot of germs in the bathroom. All health. And then come back, have a seat. Get right into it again. And uh, I said, sometimes it takes a little longer to do what you have to do. I understand that we're all that way. But try not to make it a long time. I don't want you to miss anything. 
but it's up to you to ask your fellow classmates, what did I miss? Not up to me. It's up to you. I'm giving you that freedom. And I would like you to respect the opportunity to go to the bathroom when you need to and when you want to. Don't have to ask. So they asked a few questions about, well, can two of us go at the same time? I said, no. As soon as one person goes, you come right back as soon as you can so another person can go. Oh, okay. You have to be patient because sometimes you can hold yourself for a, a minute or two, and that's okay, but not longer than go. The person who comes back raises their name, and then you put your name up. Never had a problem. Never had one problem. And what was interesting is that whenever I had parent-teacher conferences, guess what the first item was from the parent's point of view? Going to the bathroom. Yes. Thank you for what you did to our boys, my child. Allow them to go to the bathroom whenever they felt they needed to without asking. That was profound. That was awesome. And my kids and I, we talk about it all the time, how important that is. There's a lot of respect for you. I said, well, a lot of respect for students. But I never told them I went through that. But, are you ready for this? The first faculty meeting. Are you ready for this? I know it's coming. <laughs> At the first faculty meeting, the first half hour, I told them a story about a little boy. <laughs> And what happened to that little boy from the beginning to the end? And at the end, I told the teachers that little boy was me. And they drops, their mouth just dropped, their jaws just dropped. I said, why am I telling you this story? I said, for several reasons. Number one, I don't want kids to hate you as teachers. Teachers are professional people, and they should be intelligent enough to know how to handle students, not only academically, but, but health-wise, personally. That's so important to me. And I come with experience, teachers, and I'm sharing this with you. I hope, I said, I hope that you never deny a child to go to the bathroom because I can guarantee you they will hate you the rest of their lives. Boy, did I strike a chord. <laughs> And it was true. So, again, adversity does bring it out, what you have to do to communicate a concept, and it works. Now, uh, the teachers were very thankful for telling me that because they were so focused on academics. They were not focused on kids going to the bathroom. We don't learn that in college. That's something we all do. I said, yeah, I know. But there are some, te some teachers who will say no. And not just once. Sometimes they'll say it twice. And the poor kids are suffering at that point. How the hell can they study? How can they read? How can they do math? How can they listen to you if they have to go to the bathroom? Very emphatic. And they all agreed. I never had a problem with a faculty member. Because I was being honest with it, based on my experiences. I enjoyed teaching. I was a creative teacher, but I wasn't a lecturer. Most teachers are lecturers. I was not a lecturer. Now, because of my military experience and my traveling experiences in Europe, I decided that my social study classes would be student-oriented. Not teacher-oriented, but student-oriented. And I always had small groups of students working together on projects. If we were studying something like a country, like we, for example, we studied Italy in a lot of the European countries, I would have them work in groups of three. One would be the chairman of the group. One would be the, the reporter to report to the class how everything went on there. And the third person was the recorder. He just recorded the information that they had, so they had all this stuff. And then I, what I would do is that you're not always the chairman. Sometimes you'd be the reporter. Sometimes you'd be the recorder. So they had all three experiences, the whole class, throughout the whole year. 
And they loved it. They were active learners rather than passive. And then we, in the Italy one, we, we had some fun with that because I had brought back a lot of slides with me of Roman history, monuments, and so on. And what we did was to put together a program and write it up and have pictures. And I told them that I would like to do this, but I would like to tape record it. And we, you'd have to come in on a Saturday. And they said, Saturday? We can't come in on a Saturday. That's a day off. I said, we're not going to do it during the day because we're in school and we're learning other topics. But you come in on a Saturday, we'll just focus on doing this, tape recording this with the slides, or we won't do it. So they all volunteered to come in. I had a class on Saturday when we tape recorded this. And I started off the program, and they never forgot it. I hollered out the microphone, Caesar Augustus, and one more name. And they were shocked <laughs> to hear that because that was the beginning of this whole study of Italy history. And then each child had to write something about one of the pieces of history that we taught them. For example, like the Parthenon, not the Parthenon, but the... Acropolis? Uh, yeah, no, not the Acropolis, that's in Greece. The Colosseum. Uh, Colosseum. So they had to write about the history of the Colosseum based on their research. So they had to, like a paragraph they had to write. And we had each of them talk about it. And then we invited the school to come and hear our program in the auditorium. My principal almost crapped his pants. Wow, that was tremendous. The kids loved it, the teachers loved it. They couldn't get over it. I said, this is learning. This is what learning is all about, active learning. So my principal says, come to my office after school. I gotta talk to you about this. I have some ideas for you. I said, yeah, sure. And I was very proud of it, proud of the kids. I told them so. And every now and then I'd buy the class a pizza you know, a couple of pieces to enjoy. And the principal said, you should write this up for publication. I said, why? That was tremendous. Get this out to other teachers all over the country. I said, where would I get it published? And you have a publishing company down the road about a half hour, or a lot of publishing companies around, I'll help you out. And my principal, he had his PhD. <laughs> so I did, and it was published. With pictures, kids with the microphone. So that to me was an ex awesome experience that gave me all my confidence back that I lost. I was very proud of what I did. That was the beginning of many other events in teaching. For example, we would have an original play every year that I designed, a play. All kids participated, and they loved it. <laughs> I was the only one that did that in the school. <laughs> no other teacher did that. It was fun. But what was ironic about this is that the amount of learning that went on, we had to learn how to spell these words in order to say them correctly. We had to write these words based on the name of the facilities or the architect that, was, that we saw. They had to learn how to listen to others in the group of three. They had to record. They had to write. They had to use handwriting. <laughs> and, uh, and someone had to report it. They all had to report it eventually. So they learned public speaking. They learned writing. They learned listening. All the subjects were there. And without them realizing it. The only one who realized it was me. The teachers, even the teachers didn't realize it. They thought, ah, oh, you're spending so much time on this. I said, why don't we talk about this <laughs> at faculty meetings? So anyway, I thought that was a good way to teach. I was very proud of it. And I wrote other articles. We did other projects, and I wrote them up for publication. So that was done over the 10 years that I taught at the school there. And then after teaching for 10 years, I taught sixth grade and then fourth grade and tried all kinds of things out. I, again, I was very creative. I then I applied for a, 
and at the State University of College at Geneseo, New York, for their lab school, laboratory school, and I was accepted. And that's where we're going to end this episode, and we're going to pick that story up in the next episode. I look forward to hearing about it, John. Thank you so much, Tom.